Coming up, the five things that I consider when starting a diet or a training program or just getting back on it after falling off into a pile of Christmas cake. Right now, it's a couple of days before the new year and the house is still full of food. So hopefully this video will help all the people currently messaging me, saying that they could do with some advice on this topic and help me. I woke up this morning feeling like it's not possible that I could eat any more after the last few days. So I could do a refocusing on this as well. It's also gonna be quite a short video because it's now late afternoon and I've completely changed my mind since earlier. I can eat more and wanna get back to it. Let's crack on. The date doesn't matter. The best time to start eating properly or exercising right or looking after yourself is now. Not Monday or New Year's Day or the first of the month. Your body doesn't have a calendar. It simply responds to being looked after properly or not. Continuing to do bad stuff until some point in the future makes no sense to your body. If the junk food is not good, if the lack of exercise is a negative, why wait before changing? All that does is reinforce to yourself that the current state is something valuable to you that you want to hold on to until the last moment. What you should be doing is reinforcing to yourself how good what is to come will be. I want my brain to regard the fact that I'm currently averaging 27 mince pies a day as suboptimal, like I'm punching myself in the face. So when I discover a lonely pack of mince pies left in the kitchen in a few days, I throw them in the bin, happy that I dodged another smack in the mouth and not think, oh, I miss being able to eat those. However, while it is obviously the case that immediately starting something good for you is good for you, if doing it that way doesn't work for you up here, then sure, start after the first, start after the weekend, whatever line in the sand you need to draw that will give you that definitive moment where you cross over to doing good things. Just bear this in mind. And this is the reason that date doesn't matter is important. Statistically, you're gonna fail. It might be a minor setback, you eat the lonely mince pies, it could be a major setback. You find yourself in a worse state in a few weeks than you ever were before. However you fail, doesn't matter. It's what you do after that that does. And if you adopt the best time to start is now philosophy and not the random date philosophy, you're good to go straight back on it. You don't need to consult the diary to work out when now is. But if I tell myself the best time to start is January 1st and eat badly on January 2nd, January 3rd, I wake up a failure and 363 days to go until it's a good time to start again. Friends and family. This one is a two-parter, but before we get stuck into it, if you are all alone <laughs> and you're thinking that you'd be better off with people around you as you embark on your health journey, don't worry. As we're about to cover, statistically, most people are useless. You'll do just fine without them. Okay, let's do most people in a minute. First, there's a very small number of people that can actually be truly useful when you start a new diet or just start eating better or start working out, whatever it is. And I don't mean your coach or your trainer. Let's assume that people you're paying are of use. I mean friends and family. I'm 49 years old and in all those years, I've only ever had two truly useful people that have really helped me in this regard. When I was 18, I had a training partner. We both got in great shape working out together. And the last 10 months, my wife has started training with me and that's been very positive too. Every other time, people have been at best irrelevant to my progress or more likely a negative. So if you are lucky enough to have that rare someone who is beneficial, go out of your way to keep them on board. For example, the way that Jen trains is not exactly how I would train. The time of day she trains at is not ideal for me but I will happily compromise to make sure we fit together, as she does on occasion. It's in both our interests to do that. It means I end up with a training partner, a spotter of sorts, no, somebody who will eat the same meals as me, will understand why I might not want to eat something, will come and race with me. Will she do that forever? No idea, but she does right now and it's perfect. It can be very lonely to be doing something a bit unusual, to feel the odd one out. And nowadays not being overweight and inactive, that is unusual, you are the oddity. At times you can embrace that oddity. I get a kick out of running in the middle of the night when nobody else is doing so. But it's quite tiring to pretend that you're David Goggins permanently. Stay hard! The reality is having somebody occasionally say, I get what you're doing, is reassuring. So a solution, if you don't have somebody, is to do what I did when I was in that place, go find them. Get down on a Saturday morning to your local park run, sign up for a 10K, take classes in your gym, 
put yourself where you can see others doing what you do. This Christmas, Jen and I have spent it surrounded by family, but we've still squeezed in a couple of off-road trail run races with the dogs. There, surrounded by other people doing the same as us, excited to be outdoors and exercising. And that then compensates for the family visits. It's not really enough to compensate fully, but it helps. If we actually ran so much that it truly compensated, the RSPCA would take the dogs away. So the other side of this one, most people. When you lose weight or start exercising, you will be told complete gibberish nonsense by people whose opinion you might normally respect or at least listen to on other topics. So it's vital to understand that's gonna be the case. When your mother says, here's a useful tip for keeping avocados fresh in the fridge for longer, potentially useful information coming your way. But when she says, oh, you've lost weight, that can't be healthy, are you sure you're feeling okay? Gibberish. Learn the difference so you can benefit from one and have zero tolerance for the other. And it's hard to remember all that in the heat of the moment. I know I have been there many times, but you need to learn to hear the comments and then take a step back and assess. For example, if you're told that exercising daily, putting your meals into an app to see that your protein intake is okay, that that's taking it all a bit far, becoming obsessed. That might be disconcerting to hear, but wait, has that wisdom come from an uncle that looks like they're one more slice of turkey away from a cardiac arrest? Because if it has, gibberish. If training that hard, that must be bad for you, comes from a friend that doesn't know Garmin from Gremlin, gibberish, ignore it. And that may seem a little harsh. And after you've ruined a couple of Christmases, people might tell you you're being a little harsh. But tough luck. It is important to understand that what you are being told is way worse than any response that you might provide. It won't seem like it because around the Christmas table, most people will side with fat Uncle Bob. F them. They are all wrong. Making somebody feel uncomfortable about taking their health seriously when the person who should be getting grief is the lump whose best chance of seeing next Christmas is if there's a defibrillator under the tree for him is wrong. Now, in defense of people talking nonsense, a lot of the time it comes from surprise in the contrast between how you looked when they last saw you and now. People just get used to how somebody is, so it's a shock when seeing an alternative version. But that before and after shock is not always the reason people say stupid things. Many people will also reflect their own insecurities onto you. Very simply, if someone's doing something they know is wrong and they're confronted by somebody doing that thing right, a natural reaction is for them to create their own little narrative in their head about why they aren't being faced with a better version of what they could be if they could be bothered. And there's only really two ways for someone to do that. Reinforce why they're right, but there's only so many times that you can pat your obese belly and say cuddly's best, or reinforce why you're wrong. Ultimately, it doesn't matter why they're talking rubbish, it's not your problem. All you need to do is ignore it, and learn to recognize that the silence that follows your shutting down a gibberish at a family event is a good thing, despite how everyone looks. Create good habits. Good habits is everything. You don't get in shape, lose weight, get fit, get stronger, get faster, get healthier by having a goal. You do those things by adopting daily good habits. In time, you may well achieve your goal, if you even have one, but that's secondary. Great habits, no goal, healthy still. Poor habits, lots of goals, unhealthy person who's also miserable because they never achieve their goals. I've done videos on this topic before and there are many, many better ones out there on YouTube. So I'm not gonna dwell on this too much other than to give an example of what I do. So I'll imagine the next 24 hours, whether that's in my head, pen and paper, on an app, whatever works for you. If I use Google Diary a lot on the computer, I can easily share it with Jenna, as I've already mentioned, she's on board for much of what I do. So a lot of these are shared habits between us. I then work out what the key things are that need to happen for that day to be a success, and then how can I make doing those key things as staggeringly simple as possible? In fact, I want not doing them to actually be quite tricky. Once I've done 24 hours of planning, I roll those dailies forward so they fill up a week, and then I add in things that need to happen less often, every couple of days, or once a week, or once a month even. Easy examples. Let's say I wanna start every day with a healthy breakfast and a few supplements. Is all the food I need for that in the kitchen and ready to go? Is any crap food removed from the kitchen so I'm not distracted and tempted by that instead? I don't get bogged down in making up little Tupperware containers of the next three months worth of meals. For me, that is going further than I want. But thinking, what's the next thing I'm gonna eat? When will I eat it? How easy will it be to get ready when the time comes? Those are questions I do ask. 
and an example of weekly things would be stuff like park run, nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. Is my kit, my trainers ready to go? Is it in the diary so nothing else clashes with it? I want to wake up on a Saturday morning thinking, this is now what's happening. There is no, shall I do this today, shall I not? I don't want to be hunting around for my trainers, unable to find my shorts. I want to roll out of bed, into the kit I got ready the night before and go. Basically, stick things that you want to want right in front of your face so you can't avoid them. Understand your limitations. At the moment, there is a lot of talk about how people shouldn't compare themselves with how others look on social media. And that is absolutely right. If somebody has a large social media following, looks amazing, if they're famous in that world, they are by definition very unusual. Just because you know what their kitchen looks like and that their dog is called Basil, do not think they represent normal people in any way. If they did represent that, people that look amazing wouldn't be followed by millions of people on social media because they would be normal looking people. A huge amount of how they look will be down to attributes particular and specific to them that you probably don't have that make them stand out from the norm. Now here's the key thing, that concept that those people simply aren't you applies to the people throwing motivational instruction at you as well. I follow people that do bounce out of bed at 4 a.m. and have posted their workout by five. People living life by the be the hardest worker, be the best you can be, improve, improve, improve philosophy. But I am more likely to become seven foot tall and get out of bed at 4 a.m. I am not them. My brain does not work like their brain works any more than my abs do not look like the abs on the person that owns Basil. I'm not motivated by the things that motivate them. We all have different bodies, we all have different mentalities. Now that is not to say that there is an incredibly beneficial information to gain from somebody that in many, many ways you could never be like, but in a couple of ways perhaps you could. Maybe the guy that gets up at 4am also stacks his supplement cupboard really neatly, which is why I do mine the same. It's also not to say that whatever your current body or mentality, you're 100% stuck with it, good or bad. You can move from where you are, but you can't necessarily move to anywhere you like. Just understand your limitations, and then you'll not be disappointed when you bump up against them, and perhaps realize that they might prevent you from going all the way to where your favorite influencer happens to be. And of course, the most important thing to remember, everyone has things where their natural limitation extends further than others. Maybe the guy that gets up at 4 a.m. would love to be able to play the guitar as well as you could. The point is, if you discover you can't match the body fat percentage of some random on Instagram, don't worry, it's possible there might be more to life than just that one thing. Understand the science, implement it your way. If somebody asks me how is it possible that I can travel through the air in order to reach a different country to the one I'm currently in, I would, using my very limited understanding of the subject, explain to them gravity, lift, aerodynamics, flight. If you think, you're dead. But if somebody asks me how am I going on a holiday, I'll say I'm going with Virgin, priority boarding, and fingers crossed there's no children under 10 on the plane. In other words, the science that makes things happen is the science. It's real, can't be avoided, and an understanding of it, even at a very basic level, is probably pretty useful, especially to avoid unnecessary panic when I look out the window and see clouds. But I'm really more interested in the legroom on my seat. I get if I arrive at the airport and my plane has no wings, then my knowledge of the importance of wings will come in useful because I can avoid getting on that plane. But for the bulk of the flight, it's just where's my peanuts and someone shut that kid up? What's this got to do with fitness? If you are somebody who can be told calories in, calories out, but adhere to the laws of thermodynamics, ensure that you do your tricep extension in exactly this way to ensure maximum muscle contraction, etc., etc., then brilliant. Listen to the science, it's obviously right, and enjoy yourself. But if you are somebody shouting that information to others, don't be surprised when it turns out not everyone finds your message particularly motivational and instead listens to the person saying try keto or intermittent fasting or whatever else. And when they do, criticizing them by saying that the diet that they're now doing only works because intermittent fasting means you're eating less, which means calories in, calories out. That's a pointless criticism. It's like criticizing my airplane choice by saying that the comfortable seat is only at 30,000 feet because of lift exceeding gravity. I know, but I don't care. It's a comfortable seat and there's a choice of movies. Now, people picking a particular type of diet without an understanding of the science that makes it work, that's not ideal. That does lead to the real accusation that some people are simply looking for an easy solution. Perhaps it allows people to get sucked into doing some sort of ridiculous eating plan that really does make no sense. 
it gives weight to those saying diets are all stupid and weight loss is easy, just eat less, move more, which is about as useful instruction as drink less, be more sober to an alcoholic. So I agree, if someone's adopting a diet that involves eating, I don't know, a turnip a week, and when they stop and think about it, they can come up with no reason why that diet might scientifically be a good thing, then that person is not doing things right. They are sat on the shuttle bus at Heathrow wondering why they've not taken off yet. But if somebody wants to do keto or paleo or plant-based or any other eating style, because as well as a basic understanding of why it might lead to the results they want, they just happen to like that eating style, good. Personally, I've done all sorts of eating styles over the years. Going into the new year, I'm gonna be trying a continuous glucose monitor thing. Uh, will that result in me eating a certain way? I expect so, time will tell. Might it result in less cravings, more stable appetite? I hope so. Will that result in weight loss? Yes, probably. If someone tells me that's not the monitor, that's just because you ended up eating less calories, they need a smack on the head with the box. Yes, they do. Again, if just totting up the numbers and following the basics works for you on its own, brilliant, you're lucky. But if you like to use an eating style or a training style that does adhere to the science, but that's not its focus, do not be afraid to try it and do not listen too much to anyone telling you that you should just read a book on thermodynamics. Okay, that is it, I am out of here. Give the video a like and subscribe, please, because that is incredibly beneficial to me when you do so. Uh, I've got mince pies to eat and a monitor to stick on myself. I'm not sure which order to do those two in. I'm slightly worried if I put that on first, I might blow it up.